Hi, everyone. Uh, you all know me uh, by now, I guess. Uh, my full name is Thamathip Piamsambun, in case you don't know how to pronounce it. And today, uh, I'm presenting my uh, thesis topic on multimodal interface for collaborative formatted reality. So, um, first off, I'm just going to go through uh, my background a little bit for the video at least. So, I came to New Zealand in 1996 and my family obtained a permanent residency in 97. I went to Humodern High School and University of Canterbury. I left New Zealand in 2003 to briefly serve in the Thai military in, uh, for six months. Uh, later, I joined the Forensic Science Office and received uh, forensic training in two, 2005. In 2006, I received an officer training from Police Cadet Academy in Thailand. Um, later, I received a Master of Science in Computer Science from Asian Institute of Technology and basically returned to work at the Forensics Lab. I, I joined the Forensic Work Group where I spent the remaining, remaining time as a forensic examiner. Okay. I came back to New Zealand to further my education and to visit my family. I wanted to pursue applied math and at the same time learn more about HeLab New Zealand. Mark kindly accepted me into the lab and uh, as a volunteer in 2010. I found the work here very interesting and so I started my PhD last year in February. Okay, that's, that's it about me. Um, here's the content of the seminar. So basically I'm going to go through uh, explaining my motivation for choosing the topic, then uh, introduce you to my topic and the research goals. Later, uh, I'm going to describe the fun fundamental of multimodal interface design and the proposed architecture. Then uh, I will cover the two major components that Adrian and I uh, do are developing, which are the AR framework and uh, gesture library. Okay. So first off, um, before we delve into the topic of multimodal interface, I would like to il illustrate some of the interests that motivates me into choosing this uh, topic for my research. Basically, growing up, um, I have been really uh, interested in designing, modeling, prototyping stuff. And these are some of the mock up I made during high school. Unfortunately, I lost most of my stuff before I came to New Zealand. That's unfortunate. These are some of my prototype robots that I do for hobby. And I'm also interested in uh, handicraft, such as uh, fruit and vegetable carving. Uh, these are not my work. My work is only that small little yellow rose in the middle there under the watermelon. So basically, um, these are carved from fruit and vegetables, pumpkins and radish. Um, how is this related to what I'm about to uh, discuss? Basically, um, using my hand to work directly with materials through sculpting and molding is always in enjoyable. However, I always wish that I can work with digital content the same way that I do with real uh, material for many obvious benefits uh, such as having a backup copy as I always lose my original, or that I, can, I don't have to waste any good vegetable practicing. So back in 2009, my friend at AIT, who worked on a dental, sim, dental uh, training simulation, showed me his work, and this is his work. I was really amazed, you know, because like AR actually provides the interface where the virtual content is imposed into the real physical world. And this means that I can work with digital content uh, the same way that I do with real material. And so given uh, appropriate tools and to simulate the feedback, of course. Um, so I thought that if you can do it for dental training, then you should be able to do it for anything, including design related tasks. And that's how it all began for me. 
So now it's quite obvious how AR fits it into the big picture. So the next question is why multimodal interface and how does it fit in? So first, let's uh, look at the definition of uh, multimodal interface by Dumas, uh, from, uh, taken from Oviat. Multimodal interface target a more human way of interacting with computers by means of speech, gesture, or other modalities, as well as being preferred over unimodal interface by users. So from this uh, paragraph, we learn that Multimodal interface isn't just a combination of any modalities, but need to be an interaction that is natural to human, such as speech, gesture, pen base, or I guess, etc. We also learned that the multimodal uh, is prefer more preferable compared to the unimodal. In the second paragraph, on the, the, the other hand, multimodal interface have been demonstrated to offer better flexibility and reliability than other human machine interaction means. So this is enough reason for us to pay more attention to this interface because it's more flexible and more reliable. So now let us compare a little bit between the GUI and the multimodal interface. So firstly, Multimodal, uh, multiple mo modalities can be used interchangeably. Secondly, traditional interface, such as a keyboard, receive atomic and deterministic input from each keystroke. However, uh, speech is probabilistic and require continuous interpretation. Moreover, multiple modal interface depends on synchronization of multiple modalities. Lastly, time is crucial for ordering the multimodal commands. So this uh, put that interface. Back in 1980, the first multimodal interface was created by uh, Richard Bolt. Uh, put that combined speech and gesture, which supported dictic gesture where user could point at the item to select and utter the command. So we have seen the benefits of both augmented reality and multimodal interface alone. However, one may ask if there are any further benefits for combining these two, and does it make any difference in multi-user multi setting? So before we Looking at the example scenario, please look at the definition of the following terms. There are three terms here. The task space, well, is the area where user engage in their activities. The communication space is the area where users use to communicate with each other. And the input mediums are the device that users use to interact with the system. These terms are defined um, to describe the physical space in the co collaborative settings for following two slides that I'm going to show. So first look at these uh, regular settings where you have two users collaboratively working on um, some tasks. So the task space, where should it govern? It should govern the space uh, in front of screen, um, and then the, probably the keyboard and mouse uh, in front of users. And the communication space is uh, between user where user actually look at each other and discuss with each other, right? And the item uh, input medium, sorry, uh, uh, in this case is the mouse and keyboard, right? So you can see that um, the space here are not really overlap, overlap each other really well. So now let's turn our attention to the AR setting. So in this case, we have the AR setting with multimodal uh, input. Task space, again, in front of the users. Communication space between the users. And uh, input 
mediums are the speech and the hand gesture. So you can see that it, it is all happening much better in this case. Um, you may say that um, the photo was taken from different angle, and so it might overlap better. But just think of it in three dimensions, you know. At least for my sake, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the next question is why are this overlapping between space matter? Well, it matters because, and you can ask Mark on this, yeah. <laughs> um, by overlaying the virtual information into the real world, augmented reality allows multiple users to share and collaborate on virtual tasks while carrying out natural face-to-face -face communication. Combining this with hand and speech are the natural mediums in the real world. Integration of these two elements promote a common understanding of spatial structures as well as support for close collaboration between users. Well, I think that should be clear. And what make, uh, motivate me into choosing this topic? So after 18 or so slides, I have, I show you this, my thesis title. Uh, my title is Gesture and Speech, uh, Speech Interaction Design for Cooperative Augmented Reality. What it means is that uh, I'm looking into multimodal interface in AR, focusing for multi-users in a co-located setting. And these are my goals. Um, my goal is to derive the design principles behind gesture and speech interaction for cooperative AR, as simple as that. Now, let's get into the content here. We look into, now we're going to look into the multimodal interface that I proposed last year. So in designing multimodal interface, there are two unique features that we need to consider, which are the fusion of different types of data and the demand for real-time processing and temporal constraints. Well, fusion can be executed at three levels, which are the data level, the feature level, and the decision level. The data level is associated, associated with raw data and fields input such as uh, multiple video streams. Feature level is usually used to fuse closely coupled modalities such as for speech recognition from voice and lips. Decision level is the most widely used fusion method that fills loosely coupled modalities such as hand and speech. Furthermore, decision level fusion have various implementation. The co common methods are frame-based, unification-based, and statistical fusion, which I'm not going into the details here. So, okay. At TLAB New Zealand, before me, Min Yung Lee researched into multimodal interface for AR for her PhD thesis as well. Her title was Multimodal Speech Gesture Interaction with 3D Objects in Augmented Reality Environments. She had provided great guidelines into designing gesture and speech interface as follows. She recommended that um, we use speech command in fresh form instead of full sentence, which is natural to us when we give order anyway. From the us usability test, she found that responsiveness of the gesture recognition um, module greatly affects the user performance. Therefore, fast gesture recognition module is desirable. Furthermore, she found that 94% of the time Gesture commands precede speech input. Therefore, gesture trigger fusion is preferred over speech trigger. She had also learned that users prefer to have both audio and visual feedback to confirm their command inputs. Lastly, she observed that 
user made similar error using multimodal interface and recommended that learning module might reduce the error. So from the background I, that um, I uh, study, I propose Amica, an adaptive multimodal interface for collaborative AR, which follows uh, Minyun guidelines. The concept is to use computer vision and machine learning techniques for processing uh, natural hand and speech inputs in order to improve user experience. This diagram shows the data flow of the system from the perspective of a multimodal interface. So we have two um, major modalities, which are natural hand and speech there. Next, we have features extract, ex extractor, where the input uh, image and input audio stream are timestamped, and then pass on to the recognizer, where, the interpret, um, where it interprets these features into actions that reflect a specific command. Next, the integrators actually contain four constituents, the fusion engine, context manager, the profile manager, and the fusion engine. Well, statistical fusion will be used where a statistical score is computed for each combination of speech and gesture for the given temporal windows. And the result resulting in a combined and best list score. So the command can be chosen um, from the uh, list. So after the simulation, the output generator takes appropriate action for each output queues as in other normal application. So this the possible implementation correspond to the framework in the last slide. Well, this is the first draft of the possible implementation that I uh, proposed last year. Well, there are several layers as in previous description. One of the reasons that um, this is shown in layers because um, it's easier to explain multi-user support by the interface as a distributed system. Um, basically, this is designed just like uh, any modern multiplayer um, online game where the persistent world is actually hosted on the server while the user interacts with the client program. So this diagram shows that, uh, that, show that for face-to-face -face or even remote collaboration, the only layer that the system requires sharing is the simulation layer. The other layers can be handled on the client side which reduce the comp computational lo load on the server machine. Furthermore, the running mo module, which reside in the integration layer, only need to monitor user's uh, input on its own uh, end. However, um, in a face-to-face -face situation, things are a bit more complicated since users share this uh, same space. So therefore, are like likely to share the resources as, as well, then certain ambiguities can arise from this. So from the whole system, um, there are these two major components that I'm going to uh, discuss today. Um, these two are the major components that going to use a lot, about two thirds of the development time of the whole system. So first, let's look at the AR framework. So as mentioned in the last uh, uh, section, uh, we are focus, focusing on the two output cues, which are the visual and audio cues, as uh, Min Yung recommend uh, in her guidelines. So as in any AR application, we need to decide on the target display as well as the tracking method early on. And Adrian and I, we chose to use video see-through and image-based fast tracking method. Well, AR framework is uh, based and uh, extended from the AR Micro Machine projects, uh, the game with the racing car on the table. Um, it's actually uh, Adrian's ideas of using the Kinect to actually um, point down on top of the table and to reconstruct the 
uh, depth information that you get from the Kinect. Um, so these are the key library that we use in the uh, first version of the AR micro machines and later on in AR framework. So we extend the, extended the system to support multi-user with uh, individual view in the shared space using VRPN as recommended by uh, Gun. Thanks to Gun. Uh, using server and client model, we follow the proposed multimodal framework to reduce the server workload as uh, shown in the last section. This is the setup where we have the Kinect looking down on the tabletop. And actually, uh, later we discover that Andrew uh, Wilson at Microsoft Research has been using this technique since 2007. So, and today, several Microsoft projects still use this same setting in their AR desktop interface as well, such, such as the Holodesk and the uh, Applied Science Lab uh, transparent desktop. And this is our current AR framework architecture. The whole system composed of uh, six components among server and clients as shown. The server deconstruct uh, and update the interaction space on the table, as well as providing the <coughs> simulation while the client uh, listen for the state change uh, from the server. And the client apply the transform and occlusion, then render the graphics according to the user viewpoint. For this framework, we extended the library and experiment with an early prototype of natural hand interaction to uh, physics as well. So with a sheet from Osaka University who interned last year, uh, we used skin color simulation to obtain the hand lesion uh, as shown. We apply a mesh and particle based representation and also experiment with optical flow to track the hand pixel and translate particles accordingly. Last year, we didn't try the GPU-based implementation for the optical flow algorithm, which is computational demanding. And it ran really slowly on this laptop CPU. Um, this year, I had been focusing on the user study planning and uh, looking into PyCard library for uh, improving the implementation for the interaction. So I wish that I have more time to go back and optimize the implementation, and this time use GPU for uh, this optical flow. Until recently, the last person who worked on this is Asushi. Uh, and he actually uh, solved a lot of problems and fixed a lot of bugs as well. So I'm going to skip uh, the video because of the time. So we come down to the last section and our recent work, the gesture library. Well, this is the major component, the most important one actually, that will influence the outcome of the multimodal interface. Uh, basically, I have experimented with several stuff uh, since last year. At the beginning of last year, I had been experimenting with these color markers well, to help determine the thumb and index position in space and do some simple interactions such as, such as pulling and pushing the simple uh, virtual blocks. Um, and more recently, uh, Sam, Sam Davis, he developed a wonderful interaction in the Phobia AR. And that, um, as I showed in the last section, we developed the natural hand interaction. But it turned out that despite all this progress, um, there still leave a lot to be desired from, from the gesture that we really want to do. We feel like we barely scratched the surface of the problem. We want more uh, fidelities in terms of tracking. We want more natural interaction from the hands. So, Basically, 
what we have done is just a subset of a larger set of uh, all possibilities. This just to give you an idea uh, of how small we have achieved. This is a Kutkowski taxonomy of human hand glass, uh, which, which is classifying the various types of hand pose when you actually use hand to glass object. And it's only the grasping of the object alone. Apart from the recognizing the hand pose, we still also need to track the change in shape of the hand and the movement of the hand as well to get the, to recognize the meaningful uh, gesture out of it. So basically, Adrian, Sam, and I have agreed to combine our, our effort and contribute to this uh, gesture library. So we hope that the gesture library will provide the uh, API for real-time recognition and tracking of hands and rigid body objects in 3D environment. So I'm going to go through the, uh, the plan we have for the library a little bit. So the hardware interface is basically aimed at providing a flexible and extendable uh, platform so that we can interface with desired hardware to obtain the raw data. The segmentation level is, to, is equivalent to the feature extraction in the multimodal interface framework, where we can choose multiple criteria uh, criterions to filter our data. The classification and tracking is basically the lower level recognizer where hands or objects need to be identified and keep track of. The modeling is required to represent and identify the object in the simula simulation. And lastly, um, the gesture, which is the high level recognizer, uh, where static and dynamic, or as well as context based recognition, uh, perform. So, what is our progress so far? Well, we have uh, the hardware interface, so a big tick there. We have bitten pieces of uh, level two to four but we haven't touched anything on level five. So smaller ticks there, there, and there. <laughs> Better than not, nothing, you know, so. So, well, despite our effort and time spent developing this library, it is a slow process, and that we also depend on other research as well. Remember that in the design guidelines by Min Yung, she said she had suggested that we use a fast gesture uh, recognizer. However, she also suggested that gesture trigger fusion should be used as well. If you want to have a gesture trigger fusion, you need to monitor the hand in real time. Furthermore, to provide a natural hand interaction, reasonably high fidelity hand poses recognition is also required. With all these demands, we need to come up with a really fast algorithm that is computationally, computationally practical. Well, and this gives me a lot of headache. <laughs> Basically, um, right now, Sam is fo focusing on in the classification and tracking layer where he's using Point Cloud Library to track uh, objects, and Adrian and I, uh, we are focusing on the hand pose recognition. So, how do you solve this problem? Well, it had been a headache for some time, and fortunately, fortunately, Sam found this paper by Keskin, presented at uh, ICCV workshop. It is actually based on uh, Chatton's method of human pose recognition implemented on Xbox 360 for the uh, Microsoft Research uh, Cambridge. Keskin, Keskin work aims specifically at hand pose recognition. So Adrian and I have been following these guidelines from these two papers closely. So briefly, 
this, I'm going to briefly describe the process by Keskin and colleagues. Basically, they generated and trained a huge uh, synthetic data set ranging from 60,000 to 200,000 images of hand poses. Well, they used random decision forest to create a strong classifier for multiple decision trees, two features from depth information, and the corresponding 21 rebel 20, hand legions uh, through color images. Well, during one time, uh, once the classifier labeled the hand legions, they used the mean chip to find the joint position. So this should be easier for you to get the idea. Basically, in the uh, diagram A, B, and C, you can see the depth map in input from, for example, a Kinect. Then D, E, and F uh, shows the predicted hand region uh, after the classification. So, you know, we have the forest, we have the trees, then we can classify, guess which pixel belong to which region of the hand. Then, uh, in G, H, and I, it shows the placement of the estimated joint locations using the mean chief method. Finally, in J, K, and L, uh, shows the joint being connected according to the hierarchy of each joint, uh, K. So early on, we try um, our own ways, such as the color golf, which failed. Um, we hope that it can give us a fast data generation. We were a naive, well, I was a bit naive. Well, we learned that, well, dealing with a lot of colors is difficult, and a well-controlled condi lighting condition is also hard to combine. So we move on to create the hand skeleton model in 3ds Max to generate our own data set. Generating depth data is uh, slow and tricky. It took more than 10 minutes to generate no more than 100 frames of depth data. Well, however, we believe that we can do better. For the decision trees, um, we found that we need to implement our own code for the training uh, stage, at least. And we need to optimize it so it is fast enough for us to really use. Well, in their paper, Shatton mentioned in, um, that training tree trees to the depth of 20 to, to 0 from 1 million images take about one day. This is on a 1,000 core cluster. Well, I mean, despite this fact, we are optimistic. Since hand is similar and less variance among people, comparing to the human body, of course, we believe that we can do it with multiple desktops running days and nights. Hope that we can get some support. <laughs> so um, we will keep in, you informed on our progress, and so please wish us uh, luck. So lastly, uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, HitLab New Zealand, especially Mark and Adrian. I'm not sure where he is now, but yeah, uh, for the support. And uh, you're not going to believe this, but uh, I also need to thank David <laughs> <laughs> for actually helping me out looking at the Kinect SDK speech API. Thanks. Um, well, he found that uh, the uh, Kinect Microsoft, uh, microphone LA actually worked pretty well, determined the, the direction of the audio source, right? But we haven't tested it in terms of parallel input, in terms of like two users giving the input at the same time, if it can handle these two commands, right? So we need, still need to test that. So thanks. In advance. <laughs> yeah, so. That's it for my work. So, QA questions, please. Easy questions. <laughs> I actually have a question about gesture side. Um, 
what's your plan about to get your information out? Basically, uh, speech has been like zero, pretty like advanced right now, as you can see from like Siri, from Microsoft speech uh, API. So we plan that we can reuse that library to actually get the input. But as uh, I was talking about this parallel input, we still have to test how we're going to handle parallel uh, multiple audio input sources. Yeah. So that's the, actually, that's the challenge. Yeah. And anyway, in, from the guidelines by Min Yung, she emphasized on the gesture trigger fusion. Usually in multimodal interface, they have been using the speech trigger. So once the user gives a speech, then you look for the gesture, right? But this time, we want to monitor the gesture and then combine the speech later on. And that's why we put a lot of emphasis on the gesture. And that's the challenge at the moment. Yeah. What the percentage was? Uh, actions that are triggered the gesture, speech or the gesture is perceived? 94% of the time. So the user, this is from Min Yu. Uh, she learned that the user actually point first before say something, act, act first before say something. Yeah. What do you do about the other 6%? <laughs> well, that's why we need to implement this to test it out, to do the study, yes. <laughs> you know, Montel is classified. You can take a philosophy of gestures. For instance, if you say, I want to go there, usually you get it saying that before you point to the destination. As opposed to, I guess, the yeah. focus that you have would be like, I want to do this, but just to receive the speech. But it seems like the thing that you have some various things that people can yeah. talk about before they yeah, true. gesture. Like, is there a classification scheme that you use? Or you Actually, it really depends on the end application. So that's why we want to quickly get this uh, library done so we can start learning something more about combining these two uh, uh, modalities. And then in case of the multi-user case as well, I mean, we know very little at the moment about this thing. That's why, that's why we have to quickly do this and then. Before her, people tended uh, to know the speech trigger. Oh, no, no, no. I, before, before from the study, from the study, she observed that uh, people tend to do the gesture first, first before the speech. But you said most work had been previously speech. So oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it's easier because to implement. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people who haven't seen your demo. Oh, yep. Um, okay. I'm not sure why, but the video seems to show in slow motion. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. QuickTime is not available. I guess this version is using the QuickTime format. That is a non non time format. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I hope I'm not running into something unpleasant here. <laughs> it's always a, a big risk. <laughs> a bit awkward, and we have to do many takes for this. That's for this. <laughs> yeah. And this is actually the last day before the 3DI deadline. 
and I used the iPad to capture the video. You can see the reflection from this laptop. It run much better on the desktop. Yeah. This is actually running on this laptop. So there is no optical flow in this uh, video because it's so slow. I cannot get it to run um, real time. The sphere base is not actually is this good. Actually, it's kind of noisy and depend on the lighting, uh, it varies a lot. So the mesh base is doing the best. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of performance at the moment. Well, this is one of the interaction that we, we want to do, but um, we want to be able to support other type of gesture, not just this manipulative gesture. So. This is the game. This is the best part because we get to make a game. Um, hopefully, as soon as we get something out of the gesture library, we can make some some more demo uh, with Adrian Sam, and uh, we are all welcome for you guys to use the library as well to get the most out of it. I think that's me <laughs> stuck in there. This is early, early um, traction. Thank you.